Um, this afternoon's presentation, uh, The Future of Python Packaging, is by Richard Jones. Please make him feel welcome. Thanks, Joe. So uh, this is going to be a talk in kind of three parts. Um, the, my history with Python packaging goes back almost 20 years. So I'm just going to give it a little bit of a history so there's a bit of context of where we are today. So I'm going to do that first. Uh, then I'm going to talk about what we've been doing recently and then I'm going to talk about some of the things that are coming up, some of the things that are actually important that we're working on or are going to be working on the Im in the uh, imminent future. So some of the history. Um, this, there's not going to be a lot of detail in this section. Uh, it's just kind of to set the scene, if you will. So going back to 2000 or thereabouts, um, which is when kind of the modern packaging story starts, uh, Distutils was created and added to Python 2 as, as a built-in feature for Python. This was a bit of a watershed because it made two things a lot easier. Uh, it meant that people didn't, people who were compiling C modules for Python were no longer just copying around make files that happened to work for somebody else or trying to figure out how autoconf worked. Um, they were using a built-in facility. All they had to do really was identify C files and say, please make me a module. And there was enough machinery built into Python at that point to build that. And this was especially good for people who were, say, working on Linux um, because they had reasonable confidence that their thing would probably be built on Windows without them having a clue how that would work. The other thing that Distutils brought along was a packaging system so that where previously we would build up arbitrary bundles of, of files in, in, in a tar format and release them onto Usenet or somewhere on, the, on a website or something like that, Distutils standardised that, which meant that there was reasonable confidence that people could actually use the thing that you were creating. So that was kind of nice too. Another thing that came around about the same time was a thing called the Vaults of Parnassus, which was, like a lot of websites around back then, it was just a collection of links, loosely ordered. Uh, it even had the good old back and forward buttons on, on pages, just for like random clicking around, because that's what a lot of the web was. It was just random clicking around. It had very little metadata built in, and it mixed up links to tutorials with links to software. So there were no tools that actually worked uh, with the vaults of Parnassus. But it was an invaluable tool. You can't see it, but of course the little flame uh, picture up the top there, that flickered, you know, in true Web 1.0 style. So in order to try and pr uh, introduce some order to the chaos, we created the Python package index, which was an, an ordered, well-defined set of metadata in a website that people could go to to find software for their Python projects. That was done in around 2002. In 2004, we extended that website, that, that facility, to allow uploading of packages. And so it became a repository of software as well. And we also renamed it to the Cheese Shop because at the time the Python in Python project, or PyPy, uh, was also becoming quite popular. And we had issues with people coming to sprints and saying, is this the PyPy table? And I would say, yeah, sure. Um, but then they'd sit down and half an hour later they'd realise they're at the wrong table. So we now have people calling it PyPI, which I hate. Um, cheese Shop is the name. Of course, we lost the Cheese Shop name because the suits said that's not serious enough. So no, no Cheese Shop. And another effort that was going on around about the same time was an extension of the Distutils idea about, uh, about packaging software. So setup tools extends the basic features of Distutils with adding dependencies. Uh, it provided a tool called Easy Install, which you use to install packages from a website. And it introduced the egg format, which took the basic bundling mechanism that Distutils had and extended that with a few extra features. <coughs> Unfortunately, setup tools and Easy, in easy Install were controlled by one developer who wasn't, didn't play very well with others. And so we had pip and distribute came along as alternatives to those, uh, those tools, which were more collaborative exercises. 
they cleaned things up, they organised things, and they implemented a bunch of features that the community actually really wanted, uh, but couldn't get into the other tools. A lot more cooperation. Unfortunately, this meant that we had a bunch of different tools, and users were very confused. Um, not a good thing for the end users. Another thing that came along at the same time was continuous integration. Um, this is coming up to like the late 2000s. Continuous integration is awesome. It's a really good way of developing software. Unfortunately, GitHub provided free continuous integration tools and our single server was utterly swamped. And every effort we made to increase capacity was just met with more traffic. Uh, and so in the late 2000s, early you know, 2010 and 11, we were just migrating between different infrastructures trying to come up with something that was resilient in the face of just continuous integration constantly hammering and wanting files. Another thing that popped up more recently is um, that there's a book that was written which had an example of how to publish your package to the cheese shop uh, where you implemented nested list printing. And so now I have a thing that I run every now and then that finds nested list printers on the cheese shop and deletes them. <clears throat> the, so I wrote the first implementation of the cheese shop and much of the, the rest of it with help. The initial implementation wasn't supposed to last very long. Uh, it was maybe supposed to last a few years tops until it got popular and then somebody had come along and make something better. Uh, it's still going, and that's you know, 15 years later. It used HTTP basic auth uh, with no SSL. It didn't have a built-in signing infrastructure. We had the facility for people to upload signatures for the files they're uploading, but there was no tool chain support for that uh, because if you've ever done any work with GPG, building tools using GPG can be quite challenging, especially on Windows. So even with PG, uh, the GPG support in there, there's still a whole heap of attack vectors um, that we were just were oblivious of. Well, not oblivious of, but not taking into account. Another thing that came up, of course, is the issue of Linux being something that's typically, like you build a Linux system, it's your server, and you install some software on it, and the server is happy, and the software runs happy. For developers, you have the issue that you want to have your you know, desktop, and you also want to install various different bits of software on it to try them out, or to try to work on different projects. And so you have this conflict between system installed software and Python. Who want the, where you want to install a bunch of modules. The packaging systems that we had, Easy Install had no way of uninstalling modules. PIP has a mechanism for uninstalling modules, but it wasn't very good and it got better. So you end up with a very messy system. Virtual Env came along, which was awesome, and it provided the ability to have alternate ways of installing different packages of software, so you could isolate things, and that's really cool. Another thing that came along was the ability to have user local installation of software. So the tilde.local directory, which is used by different tools to different degrees, is fully supported by Python, and you can install software in there, and it'll be just transparently used by Python, which is really cool. Eventually, it'd be really great if this is the default for, Python, for, for pip installation of software, rather than installing to the system by default but that's a couple of deprecations down the track. Um, at the moment, it's opt-in, use the dash dash user, switch to pip, and it'll install stuff to the tilde.local directory, which is, again, a nice way of not polluting the system. Even on a Mac, I'm, I'm a Mac user, sorry, um, you still have that system user problem. You do not want to install software on a Mac to the system Python because Apple provides a system Python that is broken and you don't want to use it. So you have to have the ability to use a different Python, different installations of Python. And along this long story, we also had a couple of alternatives, or several alternatives pop up, a couple of which are, that have become quite popular. Uh, Active State and Conda are uh, different ways of doing Python packaging that provide a different story to users. You know, they have slightly different focuses. Active State, their packaging system mostly supports their editor environment, 
uh, and it's nicely integrated, so it's a very nice user story. Conda mostly supports scientists doing their thing with their specific packages that they need, which can be quite troublesome to build for people who aren't developers. So these things come along, and that's great because you know, we don't have to worry about the 20% the, the that we're not catering for. Somebody else is handling that story for us, which is awesome. So that's, that's kind of a canned history of where we've come from. Um, I'm now going to talk a little bit about what we've been doing very specifically in the last year or maybe slightly longer about doing more immediate cleaning up now that we're starting to get a bit organised. And one of the ways that we're getting organised is we've got a cat herder or BDFL who's stepped up to try and get everyone working together or at least going in a, in a sensible direction. And that's Nick Coglin who's sitting just up here. And the reason he stepped up was because Guido, who's the BDFL for Python, just doesn't care about packaging, which is perfectly fine by me. Uh, it's not the most interesting thing. So <clears throat> one of the most important things that happened there in that cleaning up process, apart from Nick stepping up and actually kicking it off and, and shepherding or herding, is that we've had the grand hug of set up tools and distribute and pip all coming together and being happy together and we've got some real movement. So set up tools and distribute merged, so there is just set up tools now. Uh, there's, so removing all that confusion for end users or, or packaging users to figure out which one they should use, set up tools or distribute. PIP and easy install haven't merged, but we've come out and said that PIP is the tool that people should use. Um, and so easy install still exists, but the, the strong recommendation across the board is to use PIP. Another part of this coming together is the forming of the Python Packaging Authority. Now, Nick has talked about this previously, so I'm not going to go over and over it, but the basic idea is that we've brought together the people who are working in this packaging story, all the different elements of it, we've tried to bring them together under the one umbrella. So we have groups on Bitbucket and GitHub to sort of organise the software development. We've got a, a domain at pypa.io where we host a bunch of web stuff. We've got the pip, virtual end, setup tools, pypi, wheel, distlib and a bunch of other stuff all coming up underneath though either on Bit, Bitbucket or GitHub. We even have now the, one of the efforts of the Linux distributions to kind of integrate in with this stuff working under the same on the same GitHub. One of the big efforts that's come out of that is a consistent place for documenting packaging, which is the packaging.python.org packaging guide. Um, so instead of having a bunch of different blog posts and wiki pages uh, and, and different things here and there and user manuals for different bits of software, there is a single place to go now which tells you about the ver how to do the various different things you need to do in Python packaging, either as someone who just wants to install something or as someone who wants to create a new package. There's a GitHub repository that you can clone as the thing you should, a recommended GitHub clone that you can clone to start a new package that will then be easy, easier to, to package up and, and, and share with the world. The nice thing about the packaging guide is it's on GitHub as well, so you can go to the GitHub interface and suggest an edit right there. Um, and we do get a lot of suggested edits, edits which is really good. Um, it's quite solid. Another thing that we've done more recently is the implementation of SSL across the, of, across the Python package index to protect that link between the, the repository and the end user. Um, there was a quite obvious, easy exploit demonstrated during a PyCon in the US, uh, a man in the middle attack. Uh, and so that, that's harder to do now. It's not impossible, and I'll come back, to, come back to that in a little bit. So implementing SSL was something we could do, which was, pretty, was, was relatively straightforward on the website. Unfortunately, it also meant that we needed to bo boost the support for SSL in Python itself. But that was done. There was enough momentum that we could actually get that done. And some of that momentum came about with the Ruby gems break in. And so that's given us a lot of, that's given us a stick that we can take around and hit people with and say, we really need to get this stuff together. So 
getting SSL in as well is good. Another thing that we got was support, um, so support for the stronger SSL into Python itself. So it actually does certificate checking in Python, which is something it didn't do. But also now we have pip and py uh, and virtual end for support in Python itself as well. Uh, the pip support in Python means that um, we have a better known version of pip in that people are going to start using that has these new security features, and that's and that's built in and it's available from from day one for Python users, unless you use Ubuntu. So the other thing that we've done uh, more recently is continue to improve the infrastructure that the website runs on, that the, in the index runs on. Uh, so we went from a single server in, hosted in the Netherlands to a couple of servers hosted in OSU in the US to I think we've got four different nodes in Rackspace now which uh, run like the core service and they've got a geographically distributed set of caches which have been donated by Fastly to handle the actual file files being hit by these continuous integration tools. And so the uh, reliability of the service is significantly improved now over what it was. Oh, that's neat. Sorry, I didn't... It kind of goes from one... Oh, yeah. Racks to racks. Another thing that has come up is um, trying to clean up the distribution formats themselves. And the wheel format is something that came up. This is not really new, but it's something that's starting to be adopted now by people. And the wheel format is a way of trying to clean up the, thing, the, the bundle of stuff that is the thing that you're trying to distribute. One of the issues we ran into with the previous distribution formats, um, like SDIST, you need to build it. Um, egg files, they can have all sorts of stuff in them and you can execute things. The wheel format is about saying, here's a blob of stuff that you can just copy and install it. And really, really resisting that idea that there be any sort of execution to ha that required to make that work. So just cleaning, just cleaning up that whole story. And I'll come back to the wheel format in a little bit and talk, talk a little bit more about it. Uh, now, I understand this picture is used a lot, but, you know, whatever. We're also work, trying to work with Linux distributors and, sorry, packages uh, more closely and, and figure out what that story is between Python packages and Linux packages. Um, <clears throat> that whole thing about trying to move away from default installing to the system, um, that's part of the story. But also, uh, there's some other things as well which I'll talk about in a little bit. But there's, that's, that's an ongoing thing that's been going, and I think it helps that our BDFL for packaging is also a Red Hat employee who's, who's got the people who do packaging, you know, he's got them, there's a conversation going there. <laughs> um, PIP 6.0 has just been released, which is really nice. Um, it dropped the, it, you, PIP 1.5.6 was the previous version. Uh, PIP 6.0 just dropped that one. We don't need that leading one digit, so that's why we've gone 1.5 to 6. Some of the neat things that are in PIP 6.0 are you can have client-side TLS. Um, you can turn off TLS verification for specific trusted hosts, which is nice, so you can have your own self-signed certificates and say that's okay. Localhost isn't called an insecure host anymore, so that's nice. You used to get warnings uh, if you tried to do just HTTP to localhost. Um, there's, there's a whole bunch of really nice little security features in there. Uh, the directory that PIP uses to build the software is now a randomised secure directory rather than being a predictable place. So there's, that's nice as well. It also has its own auto-update check built into it. So it'll check periodically to see whether or not it should be updated, and it'll give the user a little message saying, hey, there's a new version, you should probably update to that. And you can turn that off if you like. And on the verbosity thing, um, the output from PIP is now far less verbose, much better organised, um, 
There's even a bug that was removed. So if you ran pip in parallel, you would get duplicate output or something. So that's been fixed as well. So there's a bunch of nice cleaning up of the output of pip as well. Uh, and I think if you're on a terminal that supports Unicode, it'll even do it slightly prettier. Um, so this, this release includes some of the initial PEP 440 work, which is still kind of a work in progress. There's still a few edge stuff around PEP 440, and I'll come back to what PEP 440 is in a little bit. But basically, it's about trying to clean up the way we parse and, and assign semantics to version numbers. It's terribly exciting stuff, but it's, there was a lot of ambiguities around this, and so we've looked at cleaning that up. PIP finally has support for site-wide configuration, which is nice. Uh, and it also has now has support for operating system specific configuration locations. So where previously it would just look in tilde slash dot pip uh, for the configuration, it now looks in on OS 10, it looks in the correct place or the more, more likely place. So in, in a library application support directory or in Windows, it looks under your something something user path setting thing. Anyway, so it looks in the place that's appropriate for the operating system. And you can also have a PIP configuration specific to a virtual env as well. So if you have a virtual env that is a, a, an employer-based virtual env as opposed to your personal project one, then you can point the employer-based one at their PIP mirror, or their PyPI mirror, if that's something you need. Uh, the download cache is gone deprecated in favor of just built-in HTTP caching. Uh, just the natural progression of the libraries that PIP is built on means that it has caching built in now. Um, another thing is that if HTTP requests have failed, they're actually retried automatically now, which is nice. And there's a stack of other built bug fixes and little improvements uh, to PIP. So on the subject of version identification, the idea here is to try and standardize the myriad of different ways that tools were doing version identification and, and, and again, that assigning semantic um, meaning to the, the numbers that people were assigning to their, their um, packages. So in short, <laughs> it looks that, that it's, it's basically that, but with a bunch of words. Um, <clears throat> so you've got... The epoch segment is, is kind of a funny one. Who's, who's run into epochs on versions? Yeah, we've got you know, a few. It's, it's, really, it's something I hadn't run into before. Um, but so we've got, no, this format shouldn't be surprising, although you know, it's obviously written in a way that's not very human parsable, but it shouldn't be surprising. It, it, it really, it, it repeats the same semantic versioning systems that a lot of people are using already. But what it's doing is saying that the tools that we are developing understand this format. And if you don't use this format, the tools are not going to understand how to deal with your, your package's versioning. Um, it also formalizes the idea of having a public version and a private or you know, organization local version. So a label that you assign to say, well, I've taken that public package and I've had to make a few changes to it to work locally. And, you know, I've vended it for our organization. Here's, and I'll attach an extra bit of significance to the version label for that, for that package. And, and we'll put that in a local repository. So the tools all understand how to, how to deal with that. There's a bunch of other considerations, and this is where the words come in in the PEP, uh, because everyone is a special snowflake. So there's all sorts of stuff in there about case sensitivity, um, integer normalization, pre and post release specifiers. So some people like to use pre, some new people used to like P, and some are RC or whatever. Version, there's variations on the various alphabetical you know, com components, so B and beta. Um, Compatibility issues with other versioning schemes. So very specifically, how we handle people who really like to specify dates as their versions. Um, yeah. It also talks about ordering mechanisms and... So it, it talks about ordering mechanisms, but it also talks about how to deal with those in specifying package versions that you want to use. 
so that, again, so that we can standardize this across all of the different tools that deal with Python packaging. Uh, so there's a set of different things, and these are, the, these are the version specifiers that you find in your requirements.txt file or whatever, whatever tool. I mean, that's the most common, but whatever tool you happen to be using to fetch and organize your Python packages. Um, just, a little, just a little note, the compatible release clause is something that um, was relatively new to me. Uh, it's kind of neat. Who, who's familiar with compatible release clauses? Yeah, not so many. So the idea there is to say, look, um, I'm using 2.3, 4.3, right? That's, that's the version I'm currently using. But the creator of that has said that anything that starts with 2.4 is going to be compatible. So the version specifier says that any version 2.4.3 or later, as long as it's a 2.4 release. Um, so that's, that's what the compatibility clause is saying. So, the wheel format, I, I mentioned that in passing. So the idea here is to, as I think I alluded to, is to clean up the thing that is the bundle of software that's being installed, to separate that concern of building a thing for, to, from installing the thing. So the wheel is just a thing that's installed. Somebody has to build the wheel separate to it being installed. Whereas at the moment, we're all distributing source distributions, so everybody has to be capable of building those source distributions. Um, which is both a complexity issue and also a time issue. It takes, just takes longer to install a source distribution. Wheels, build, wheels are installed almost instantly because it's just a copying files around. Uh, the architecture of a, zip file, of a, of a wheel file is... It's basically a zip file with a bunch of files in it which are copied to the file system, and that's it. Um, wheels don't support being in imported directly uh, as, as zip files at the moment, but that might be added, but it's not really something that's... Uh, I don't think there's even a plan for it. Yeah, it's, it's not explicitly supported, whereas eggs, that was something that eggs specifically supported. So eggs are kind of like wheels, except... There's a bunch of differences that I've already alluded to. One of the m most important one being that eggs had stuff in it that could be executed, and wheels avoid that, except for one case. <laughs> Again, special snowflakes. Um, yep. Okay, so that's wheels. They're, 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 I've ver very few slides there because they're such a simple format. Uh, but the important thing is it's just making it easier for people to install your stuff. So if you have the ability, please create wheels uh, and upload them to the cheese shop so people can install your stuff. Even if you're just shipping something that's pure Python, still create the wheel, because installing a wheel is so much simpler. Linux wheels, though, become a tricky story. So, and the reason for this is that almost no two Linuxes are the same. Obviously, that's a very, very, very broad generalization. But even Python itself isn't necessarily the same between two Linuxes. Whereas on, on Windows, the set of Pythons is smaller. Python can be compiled in different forms, but it can also be linked against different libraries. Um, Python 2 was less easy to deal with in this case. Uh, because of ABI compatibility issues, uh, some, some of them just around the Unicode implementations that were compiled in. Python 3 cleans this up a lot. It has um, more promises about ABI compatibility built into it. And then, of course, there's the separate problem, which is that Linuxes aren't necessarily very compatible with each other. Just the set of things that are installed can be so much more variable between different Linuxes. So the end result is that wheels compiled on one Linux may not work on another one. So there's a bunch of different solutions that have been proposed, and there's a lot of thinking around how to solve this problem. Um, 
In fact, there was a, a solution proposed only about two weeks ago, I think three weeks ago, uh, which seemed like a really neat idea, but unfortunately um, it, it lasted about two weeks or even less um, before somebody you know, poked the ob <laughs> two days before somebody poked the obvious hole in it. So if you have an interest in this, um, then I would highly re um, I would ask you to get involved in the discussion to try and sort out the Linux compatibility tagging thing for wheels so that Linux can have wheels. Because until we solve this, there's not really much point in us supporting uploading of Linux wheels to the cheese shop because the chances are that we'll just get a bunch of people emailing me particularly saying that the thing they downloaded is broken. Um, and yes, I'm the administrator still of the cheese shop, so I get these support requests directly. Yes, so it's, but it's, it's not all doom and gloom. We're pretty sure we can solve this, or at least come up with an 80 to 90% solution, um, which is actually pretty close to OS X. It's, you know, OS XE still has the same problems, just not on quite as large a scale. OS X developers have Brew installed, or Homebrew installed, or Mac ports installed, and the compatibility between those can vary. So it's, especially if you do something like Brew install OpenSSL force link, then you've got, you know, a wildly different version of OS, OpenSSL installed, which can break stuff. So... It's something that we are pretty sure we can solve. We just need more brains on the problem. How much? I think I've got, yeah, five, six. Yeah, okay. So let me talk briefly about mirroring. So mirroring was one of the things we came up with to, as a pro potential solution to the um, CI uh, is hammering us problem. Well, actually, it came up kind of before then as, as a way of scaling things up. Um, and, and a formal uh, mechanism for creating mirrors was, was added to the cheese shop, um, and that was all good. Unfortunately, it didn't really work out so well. Um, the mirrors were a bit uncontrolled, and syncing was a real problem. So the mirrors are just dead. Uh, we've come up with a different way of solving the availability problem. You can still create your own mirror, so you can still set up a mirror inside your own organisation, it's just that public mirrors aren't as necessary or even as desired as they once were. There's a, there's a tool called Bandersnatch, which is recommended through the packaging guide, which is the tool that you should use if you wish to set up a mirror inside your organisation. Um, <laughs> yes, so Bandersnatch, that's the thing to do. And there's information in the packaging guide about how to set that up. It's actually quite straightforward. Another thing that people do with uh, the cheese shop is proxy their requests through a local proxy. And the reasons for doing this are many and varied. The reason I do it is that occasionally I'm offline, I don't have internet access, and I still want to be able to install the packages that I, I need. So if I run all of my requests through a proxy, those packages are available locally. The proxy can say, well, I don't have an internet connection. Here's the last version that I retrieved. And everything still works. Uh, and there's a, there's a great tool called DevPy, which uh, lets you set up a local, ca uh, local caching proxy for your cheese shop accesses. It's very easy to, to set up. And that gives you a bunch of resilience against outages and, and that, ca that offline caching uh, facility. It has a whole heap of other features built in as well. Uh, in particular, you can set up a, an organisation specific or just a local personal repository that you can upload packages to. Uh, and there's a bunch of different configurations that you can use to do that. The, common, the most common configuration for DevPy is just as a straight caching proxy where you... Uh, this is the default setup that you get, where you point your pip command at the DevPy, which is the colourful box, uh, and it just transparently goes through and fetches stuff that it doesn't already have from the internet. And it understands the, the, enough of the API of the cheese shop to do things relatively sensibly. But if you're in an organisation where you have your own private packages that, that the organisation is generating, and indeed you might have those across multiple teams, then you can have an internal company index which sits in front of the global or the, the, the public cheese shop, 
and f packages can be fetched from that first. And then if you have teams which are working on development releases, then they can go up to development indexes which sit in front of that, pub, you know, that company release index as well. So you can have multiple layers here and it can get all very complex. But this stuff is built in and it's actually reasonably easy to, to uh, configure in DevPy. If you want to know more about DevPy, I gave a talk about it at PyCon AU last year, uh, and that's the link to it. But now I need to talk a little bit about where we're going from here. So um, I assume everyone got their hoverboard um, this year. No? Okay, so a big problem that we've got is that with the history of the cheese shop, as we started off as an index of pointers to other people's stuff an index to pointers of web pages you could go to to get a piece of software. And that history is still with us. We still have to deal with these external packages. So one of the problems we've got is dealing how to improve the way we're dealing with these external packages. People still have a need to have their package hosting outside of the cheese shop for personal reasons, for legal reasons, whatever. So we have a PEP that's been in development for some time now. Uh, it's PEP 470, and it's stuck in development hell, to borrow a phrase from the film industry. Uh, it needs a lot of extra thought, and one of my key concerns as the guy who approves this PEP once it's in a state that's good, one of my key concerns is not breaking everything um, or not breaking a bunch of stuff along the way. So external packages and the support for them is something we're still trying to solve. We're also looking at the metadata that we're currently generating as package authors and figuring out how to... Well, the, the metadata set was basically designed about 15 years ago. Well, 13 years ago. So we've come a long way since then. We've added some capabilities to things. We've extended it in a few different ways, set up tools, added a few things to, to the basic metadata. So there's an effort now to have a look at the metadata that we've been generating and how we might clean that up. We're also looking at moving away from having the metadata locked away inside a Python file that you have to execute in order to get the metadata out. So looking at storing that out in a separate static file so that tools can get at it. And I'll come back to metadata in a, in a little bit because my slides are slightly in a funny order here. Another big thing we're working on at the moment is this continuing look at the security story around the cheese shop. And in particular, there's a thing called the update framework, which uh, is a system that grew out of... Um, it grew out of the Tor project as a way for them to securely update their software. And what they've done is they've taken, the, the people who worked on that have taken that effort and formalised it as a, a, a paper, an academic paper, and they've proposed a way for the cheese shop to integrate some of these uh, security ideas into what we're doing. Um, so we actually have two PEPs that have come out of that. One of them is talking about securing just the link from the cheese shop to the end user. So we're now in a situation where we have HTTPS covering the link between the end user and, and the cheese shop, except not quite, because it actually secures the link between Fastly and the end user, and then Fastly talks to the cheese shop. So if Fastly is compromised, then our users are compromised. So, oh, and also anybody using a mirror is in the same situation. So if the mirror that they're using is compromised, then you know, they cannot trust their packages. So PEP 458 is about, in, is about securing that connection between the package that is uploaded to the cheese shop and the end user. There's a whole bunch of complexity around this involving multiple levels of signing uh, and online and offline keys. If you're interested in this, I highly recommend that you have a look at the draft that is currently up online. Um, it is actively being worked on, although the number of edits aren't necessarily changing the, the implementation proposed. They're mostly cleaning up the language around it to describe it better. 
because again, I'm the guy who gets to approve this and I need to be able to understand it. So this is about protecting us against man-in-the-middle attacks, which we kind of did with HTTPS until we brought Fastly in and now we've got the same problem again. So the next problem we've got to solve is a compromise of the cheese shop itself. So somebody breaks in to the cheese shop servers, um, what can we do to prevent, uh, to, pr to provide end users some confidence that they're not going to be owned as well? Uh, so PEP480 is about allowing package authors to sign their packages directly. Now, wait a second, I hear you say. Well, I didn't actually. So we already have GPG signing in the cheese shop. Isn't that good enough? Well, as I already said previously, GPG isn't the ideal tool. It's not user-friendly especially on Windows. What the PEP480 approach is providing is a significantly more user-friendly approach, almost transparent to most users, and yet providing the same level of confidence to them that the package that they are retrieving is, hasn't been tampered with along the way, and that's PEP458, and is the same package that the, the author intended to provide right back at the start, and that's what PEP480 is providing. It's an opt-in thing, so for a, a package author who doesn't have that much of a, um, doesn't really care that much about that aspect of things, they don't have to opt in to the PEP480 stuff and explicitly sign their packages. But another thing that it's doing is trying to make that step easier so more people do it. And again, the, the GPG thing is a little bit more complex, and we can talk about it after. PIP is still being worked on. It's constantly being worked on to make it more user-friendly. VirtualEnv is actually being rewritten at the moment, or at least there is a rewrite of VirtualEnv in work at the moment to clean it up, because again, it's a tool that's been around for a while, and we've learned a bunch about how it can work. We've got new facilities built into Python to make VirtualEnv's work a lot simpler. So it's, yeah, it, it, there's a lot of work that can be done there, and, and it's being worked on right now, a, a, a from-the-ground-up rewrite. We've had a new version of the cheese shop itself in work for a number of years now, and honest, we will get there one day. Um, we've, we just need to find a little bit more time to, 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 to finish it off. If you are interested in websites and the cheese shop and all that jazz, come along and help. We just, I think we just need a few more hands who are willing to dedicate the time uh, to, to helping get us going. And, yeah, so finally, the, well, yeah, the Linux story is getting there. So the conversation is still going on with, between the Python packaging and the Linux packages. The conversation around what we put into the packages in terms of metadata to make it easier to generate system packages, or system uh, Linux packages from Python packages. That's going on as well, and it's part of the metadata revisioning that's going on at the moment, with the hope that we can just say automatically generate a, a Linux package from the Python package. But that one, that needs, more, that needs more eyes and more brains on the problem. Linux is a, is a large problem that we need to more people working on and, and trying to solve. So if you're interested in any of this, then we, we all live at PyPA. We're all a big, happy, huggy family these days, and we welcome contributors. Um, so please come along. Thank you. probably don't have time for the questions. Um, we have a little bit of time for questions, if anyone oh, has okay. questions. OK, we'll start oh, here. Yeah. <laughs> Good day. Um, I guess I'm interested in the how Python's packaging system, as you're doing it there, is also looking at integrating with distros packing, packaging systems, and is there is it making that easier? Is, so, it, is it a goal as well? Oh, absolutely. So yes, the, the idea with the, 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 current, the current efforts we're going through with the, the looking at the metadata 
that we're, we're, we're creating when we create packages, uh, the way the packages are bundled, so the, the, the wheel format stuff, all of that, it's not only make, trying to make things nicer for the end users, but it's also trying to head towards that, that a place where we can just, yeah, as I say, all, automatically generate um, Linux packages where possible. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very much a high priority. Hello. Um, I wonder if there are any plans to introduce some additional quality control to the cheese shop, because it's scary how often I find packages that aren't licensed, don't build, classifiers are wrong. Yeah. So we actually had a quality mechanism built into the cheese shop uh, for a couple of years, a few years ago. Um, unfortunately, the, the people who created that had some negative feedback. The, so the system just went away. Um, the, what I would like to see is for a third party website to come along, use the APIs we've got and provide, you know, quality, pythonquality.com or .io, whatever, and, and, and have that information there. That's why it's that way we have some issues with, you know, are we officially saying that this package is not so good or, you know, so we run into problems when we try and do that sort of thing. If, if somebody was to set up a third party thing, that would be brilliant. The actual code to, that, that, that was created to do the quality metrics is still out there. Um, the, the project is still out there. It's just not running. And it was called Cheesecake. Cheesecake. Yep. Um, sorry, I was just making a note of the name of that package. Um, one, is there any likelihood that the PSF would support the costs of running that one? Because I actually kind of half built one and never put it anywhere. Um, so to immediately answer that, ask them. OK. Um, they, they don't buy it. The other one is... Now, this is the third time I've seen this talk, and the third time I've seen the final point left unsaid of the other POSIX environments that do not have a problem. Um, when will Wheel begin to support FreeBSD and the rest that don't have a constant problem of breaking everything every time you change the tiniest thing? I think when somebody steps up and contributes it. That's the short answer. I th it, 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 there's a lot of things in the Python packaging land that just need somebody to, who gives a damn to step up and, and, and contribute. There's not necessarily a, a, any sort of... There's no stop energy that I see against that sort of thing. So, yeah, it's just that somebody hasn't done it. We have time for one more short question. Yay, no more questions. <laughs> Run. <laughs> and terrible. And just to say thank you for your presentation today, we have a small present to give you. Thanks. You're welcome. And please thank Richard.